Good morning. I hope that God has granted you a great week. Already this morning, we have had the opportunity to sing praises, pray, and hear the Word of God together. My prayer as we continue to look into the Scriptures is that you will be challenged and encouraged. I want to clear up the air about something. Now, I don't desire to offend my wonderful vegetarian and vegan friends, but what is up with tofu? Does anyone really believe that this can be a viable replacement for, say, a steak? And while I'm at it, what is going on with this thing where places like Burger King or McDonald's are offering burger substitutes that they are calling Beyond Burger? This plant-based meat substitute attempts to copy real hamburger, but testers stated such things as not meat-like, but meaty. The insides are like a grainy sponge. It has a weird synthetic taste. I don't know about you, but unless I need to, unless I'm starving, I am not going to choose to eat something that tastes like a grainy sponge over the real thing. This is the general truth about substitutes. Real wood is better than fake wood, and real leather is better than vinyl. This holds true with our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. When we try to replace God with all manner of human things, all it does is produce a life and faith that has a weird synthetic taste. John Christostom stated it like this, Poor human reason, when it trusts in itself, substitutes the strangest absurdities for the highest divine concepts. Of course, in terms of a relationship with God, the only exception is the work of Christ who substituted himself on our behalf by dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and raising and saving us from sin and death. Jesus took our place because we keep trying to replace him in our lives. As John Stott states it, he says, The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Our parable for today is found in a section of Luke chapter 12, 13 to 21, where a man appeals to Jesus to intercede on his behalf about a dispute that he is having with his brother over their inheritance. Jesus tells this parable as a way to address this man and, and all, really all of us. It is a parable that is, in one sense, identifying a kind of replacement theology as the human heart constantly is drawn to seek its own satisfaction. It deals with a pondering that entered C.S. Lewis's mind when he stated, I sometimes wonder whether all pleasures are not substitutes for joy. When we find, what we find when we take a closer look at the parable Jesus tells, it is a story about a person who seeks what pleases himself and in the process actually neglects his joy. We are introduced to the parable, as stated earlier, in Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13, when Jesus is teaching his disciples and there are crowds present. As Christ is teaching, a, a man interrupts and wants Jesus to get involved in a quarrel that he is having with his brother, presumably his older brother. He somehow believes that if Jesus will side with him, his brother will give him some of the inheritance. We do not know if he has received nothing or he is simply dissatisfied with what he has received. In verse 14, Jesus declines to get involved, but not because he does not have the authority to do so as God, but because he is not assuming the role as a human arbitrator. More importantly, Jesus, Jesus is really more concerned with the spiritual problem. So while Jesus does not settle the dispute, he does involve himself in a way that is significantly more important. As a quick aside, Jesus' response to this man has something to teach us. It shows us that there are a number of occasions in our lives as believers where we might want to ask ourselves if we are involving ourselves in the right causes. It also should give us pause to consider that when we are involved in a situation, are we trying to use a human solution or are we 
looking to solve the real spiritual problem that lies behind it. Jesus does not dismiss this man. He does not say that he wants nothing to do with him. He just doesn't want to involve himself in the present presented problem, but the real one that really is there. Jesus indicates in verse 15 by means of a warning that the real issue is that this man has a problem with coveting that has produced a perspective that sees the value of his life as being attained in what he possesses. So what is coveting? Baker's Encyclopedia of the Bible defines coveting as an inordinate desire that places the object of desire before love and devotion to God. So often we can be guilty of thinking that coveting is wanting something for ourselves that is a, that is a possession of someone else. For example, in the Ten Commandments, to covet is to want another man's wife. If this is how the definition should be limited, then how Jesus addresses this man and uses this parable uh, in his story does not make a lot of sense. The man may only be wanting what is owed him. And in the case of our parable, as we will see, the landowner is not concerned with wanting what others are having, but is making plans for what he already possesses. Coveting is wanting what we want and not wanting God. It is having a desire that competes with complete love and devotion to God. So what that means for every day is that if I am making decisions, directing my ambitions, money, efforts towards anything other than God, then I am guilty of coveting. The thing about coveting is that it can take something morally neutral and even possibly good and distort it into a sin. The man who addressed Jesus was entitled to an inheritance. The landowner in the parable did nothing wrong by producing a crop. Owning a house, being wealthy, having power, even honor, desiring safety or security, wanting a skill, or hoping for freedom are not wrong, unless these things are competing for your love and devotion towards God. You and I know when we are coveting, whenever anything begins to draw us away from what God says we should do or encourages us to do what he says we should not do. For a moment, let's come back to where we started. We began by talking about substitutes. And is that not what we do when we covet? What we do is we disregard God. We dismiss Jesus who gave us his life. And we spurn the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Our covetous hearts fight to replace God with what we have foolishly determined is going to give us life. And do you know who we are trying to please? And I dare say worship when we covet? When I am covetous, I am worshiping myself. I am the idol of my own life. And when you covet, so are you. Jesus tells the crowd that coveting is a problem because our lives are not about what we have. When Jesus speaks about life, what do you think he means? Is he talking about the 70 to 90 years we may have on this earth? Jesus is concerned with bigger issues, and this includes aspects of life. Of course, he is concerned about our lives today but he is also thinking about our lives for eternity. Life is not just about our physical well-being, but speaks to what is our meaning, what is our purpose. In a sense, life is a kind of metaphor for salvation, for abundance, for values, for purpose, and life beyond these physical restraints. So let me ask you, do you believe in eternal life? Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? Do you believe that as a follower of Christ, you have eternal life, that you will be with Christ after you die or, or when he returns, you'll be with him forever? Do you believe that eternal life is infinitely better than life here and now? Then why? Why do you and I so often live for today we live for this earthly existence as if this is all there is.
Think about it. If you and I really believe that 99.9999999 and go on forever percent of our lives will be with Christ in joy that is infinitely better than today, why do we dedicate so much of our meaning and purpose to now? We are prone to being covetous people who put our energy into the the point zero 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 zero, and again you can go on forever point zero 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 one percent of our existence, which is here in this day in this life. We are a substituting people. We are like the foolish person who would rather pay a thousand dollars to buy a painting of the mountains than patiently save in order to see them in person. We are like the person who desires a piece of decadent chocolate cake, but rather than take the time to bake it, just goes to the shelf and eats some Oreos. Jesus uses his parable to teach this man and us about the propensity of our hearts. In this story, there is a man who is very rich. He is a landowner and a farmer who probably has to do very little work himself because he can afford to hire the labor that he needs. It turns out that he he has had a very good year and does not have enough room in his barns to store all of his grain. And rather than build additional barns that might use up valuable land for growing crops, he decides that he's going to tear down those barns and he's going to build bigger ones that will store his crop as well as other goods that he possesses. It may also be that he has decided to store up his grain rather than to sell it so that he makes sure that when he does sell it, he's going to get the best price he possibly can. Up to this point, everything that this farmer does is quite normal. We might even say it is very prudent. No one's going to criticize him for what he has done. For all intent and purpose, he has carried out extremely good business practices. In verse 19, things, though, take a turn for the worse as Jesus reveals the condition of the farmer's heart. With all of his abundance, he reasons to himself that he has enough, that he can relax, he's going to put up his feet, he's going to eat, drink, and be merry for many years. What it looks like is this man has hit the jackpot, he has picked the right numbers in the lottery, and he's swimming in enough wealth wealth to consider retiring. The problem is, is that he has taken an approach to retirement that can trip us up, whether we are at the stage of planning for retirement or we're living in it. He turned to a life that pretty much ignored God, what God wanted, and he focused on himself. He had chosen a plan for his life that was about his pleasure and not the pleasure of God. In terms of of applying it to today, any plan that we have for life, our education, our our wealth accumulation, uh, family plans, leisure plans, or even our plans for for retirement, that do not place God first in those plans is actually an embrace of hedonism. We, like this farmer, can be good managers according to this world, while morally mismanaging our lives because we orchestrate our lives for pleasure in ourselves and not through and in Christ. This assessment is revealed in the conclusion of the parable in verse 20 and Jesus' comments in verse 21. The parable turns from the thoughts of the farmer to the words of God. God responds to this man by calling him a fool. From a spiritual perspective, God is saying that this man is not unlike the person addressed in Psalm 14.1, where it says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The farmer thought he had many years ahead of him, but God says no. Rather than a long life enjoying his wealth, this man will die that night, and everything that he has accumulated, all the plans that he has made, will do him absolutely no good. The farmer had neglected to remember what it says in 1 Samuel 2.6, that the Lord kills and brings to life. And God is here to remind him of that. He thought that he was in control of not only what he possessed, but life itself. And for his arrogant disregard for God, he would not wake up the next morning. I cannot help but think that if he had taken the approach commended in James chapter 4, verse 15, 
when it explains that we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that, he would have lived. This foolish farmer had replaced himself, his own autonomy for the rule and the reign of God in his life, and for that covetous attitude, he would die. Jesus concludes saying that anyone who does what this farmer did, he would face the same fate. Is this true? It would not seem so because if we take a look around for only a moment or two, we see plenty of examples that seem to contradict Christ's words. But perhaps Jesus is expressing more of a spiritual truth rather than one that is only regarding physical life. That means that treasure is not simply money and possessions. Then it is all that leads to a covetous life, all that epitomizes a life of hedonistic, idolizing self-worship. The person that lives that kind of life will face spiritual death. I am glad that even with this dire proclamation that Christ provides for us, he also provides an alternative. In an indirect way, Jesus is telling the inquiring man, the crowds, the disciples, and all of us, a better life-giving way is in front of us. The command to us is to seek to be rich towards God. This certainly means at least a couple of things if we are to be people who seek truth and life rather than covetousness. First, it means that God has to be set in our hearts as our greatest treasure. Think about what that means for a moment. When a person hears about a precious treasure and desires to pursue it, what do they do? It becomes the obsession of his or her heart. Their life is no longer their own. Their life is completely engrossed in attaining that treasure. Dare I say it becomes their worship. Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, that a man discovered a treasure and then he sold all that he had to possess us, possess it. We are to give up all that we have and attain, and attain Christ as our treasure. John Piper states, What is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is sin. Second, it means that we are to spend every part of our lives on God. We have to stop thinking about this life less as something we own and more as a gift that we are to steward. When we make decisions about any part of our lives that do not seek first the kingdom of God, we are playing with covetousness. That is scary for me. Because if I am honest, I have way too many thoughts, ambitions, and actions and plans that may be uh, morally neutral, but are not really expenditures on God. I am often guilty of planning something and not stopping and asking God, is what I'm doing going to bring you honor or am I doing these things simply for my own pleasure? I have so often failed to heed Spurgeon's words when he said, Time is short. Eternity is long. It is only reasonable that this short life be lived in the light of eternity. A life that is spent on God does not necessarily stop enjoying what God has provided, but it does make sure that it regards all things as God's provision and strives to worship the provider and not the provision. If we do not, we are guilty of what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 18 to 25, when he says that in our wisdom we are fools because we exchange the glory of God for images of his creation. We deny God's truth and embrace a lie that worships and serves the creation 
rather than the creator. The consequences can be permanent and even eternal. They always affect our relationship with God, and often they have extremely negative effects on our relationships with one another. In this parable, the farmer spoke exclusively in the first person. It was all about I, I, I. And over the many years that I have fought covetousness in my own life, I've discovered this very same truth. When it is always about me, I always end up unhappy, and it always steals what I should be giving to others. I always have to deal with the guilt of sin, and Christ is always ignored. It is interesting that Jesus talks about anxiousness and worry immediately following this parable, and it makes me wonder how often my anxiety or my worry comes because I have substituted Christ for something else in my life. William Law hits it on the head when he says, All the wants which disturb human life, which make us uneasy to ourselves, quarrelsome with others, and unthankful to God, which weary us in vain labors and foolish anxieties, which carry us from project to project, from place to place in a poor pursuit of we don't know what, are the wants which neither God nor nature nor reason has subjected us to, but are solely infused into us by pride, envy, ambition, and covetousness. Will you walk alongside me for for just a moment more? And I will confess to you that I am guilty of many occasions in which I have substituted Christ with myself. Have you done the same? When we recognize this as true, we must praise God for his discipline that reaches out to us with his love, with his gentleness, and with his grace. It is then our responsibility to respond to him. Please keep walking with me for this next part. Are you in a time of your life, like I have been, when you can't hear the truth of Jesus' words? I've, I've tried to explain them through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do they simply not make any sense? You are hearing the words, but you're not really listening. You don't hear that Jesus' words are for you, because you, like me, are a covetous person. My prayer, even at this moment, is that you would see the spiritual blindness you're under. Even if you are convinced I'm incorrect, please stick with me a moment longer. What I mean is this. Will you humor me and pray a short prayer, a sincere prayer? Will you stop and pray? Lord, if there be any way in me that is covetousness, would you, through your Holy Spirit, show it to me? Please show me where you have not been my treasure. Our response to have no substitute treasures can be carried out in the following manner, in the following ways. I think that it all begins by setting aside some time and thought to in doing a kind of an admission inventory. First, look at the big picture of your life, its totality. Kind of step back for a moment and try to see the wider view of things. And then honestly ask yourself with the guidance of God, have I replaced Jesus in my life? Secondly, do an inventory of those things that are associated with covetousness. Like, for instance, how am I selfish? Do I operate for myself? How am I greedy? Do I lack a desire to be generous? How am I envious? Do I compare myself to others? How am I materialistic? Do I live only for earthly things? How am I proud? Do I think that I am the most important thing? Then in an inventory, it is important to evaluate how our time, our talents, and our treasures are being used. If I'm serving, if I'm using my my gifts to edify and encourage God's people, and if what I have and and the money I make is prioritized for Christ, I'm, I'm directing my life, I'm living my life towards God as my treasure. In the midst of doing an inventory and as a result of it, we should naturally be led to pray. We need to pray in order to confess our sin of coveting. We must pray to ask God to be our treasure. We must confess to Christ our struggle to spend our lives on ourselves and not God. And we need to ask Jesus to empower us 
to never substitute him for anything, then in order to guide us, we cannot fall into the trap of thinking that we can pursue a life where God is our treasure all on our own. That is pride. That is a trap of the devil himself. I was reading recently that Tim Keller commented that in all of his many years of pastoral ministry, he has had people come to him confessing all kinds of things, but never confessing their covetousness. And when I think about my ministry and my experience in it, I think he's kind of right. Let us, as the body of Christ, change that. I'm confessing to you that I am guilty of coveting, that I have And I am, at different points, substituting Christ for myself. That I think I can live my own life. I'm guilty of being my own treasure. Confession to one another is the beginning of victory because it draws sin into the light and puts off our pride. Whether it is to me, to one of our elders, to a trusted Christian friend, your spouse, please. Do not try to overcome covetousness without accountability. Finally, overcoming covetousness only comes when we take action. While all spiritual changes have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are still called to take responsibility. In this case, it means reading and studying your Bible to understand the many ways it calls us to obedience and striving to obey. It means taking action from what came out of the inventory mentioned earlier. It takes prayer to ask God to help you rejoice in Him as your precious possession. And it takes the tremendous hard and humbling work of rebudgeting your life from you to God. I want you to know that I am in this struggle with you. It was the other day, I was doing some evening reading, and I, I, I was reading uh, about um, some things about hiking. As many of you know, I enjoy hiking, and I was reading about how a person had stepped back from their life, their busyness, all the things that were going on, all the seemingly chaos of their life, and they decided to sell everything and dedicate their life to traveling and exploring nature. The article showed these wonderful professional pictures of far-off places and promoted all the advantages of such a life. And as I read about this, I had this rising desire and envy and ambition that captured my heart and came out in a voice in my mind. This is what you need. This is what you should do. I was tempted by something that could justify itself in in probably uh, many ways, but it fell down on its face. The next moment, through the grace of God, My mind came out of the deceptive fog, and I saw the truth. My life is not my own. I was bought with a price. The happiness of my own desire could not replace God. It was simply a lie. It was a wonderful, beautiful lie that would kill me. If I were to do what was in my heart, I would not have a church family. I would not be serving the body of Christ. I would not be giving to what is precious to him. I would be living a life of covetous self-worship. I would be exchanging truth, the true fulfillment that comes when Christ is most glorified in me. I would be exchanging this for a lie. What wonderful, beautiful lie is taking Christ's place that is substituting Jesus in your life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to come before you this morning with praise and thanksgiving for how you love us and watch over us. Thank you for the grace that you've given us in your life that we, at many points, Walk away from you as our heart is prone to wander. And yet you draw us back in your gentleness. You are our shepherd, and we are the sheep of your pasture. You lead us beside cool waters. You bring us to to grasslands to feed. You watch over us and protect us. And yet, what do we end up doing? We end up wanting to stray. 
one of the ways we stray, Lord, is to replace you. Replace you with another shepherd of our own making, of our own lives, of our own desires. And it can be many things. Lord, forgive us for our coveting, for the way that we have set up idols in our life, worshipped our own ambitions, our own wants, that we have thought at many points that our joy, our satisfaction, our fulfillment is found in anything else but your glory. Forgive us. Forgive us for our sin and restore us to your fellowship. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive us and you promise that you do. And I pray for each one of us that we would walk in your ways, that you would guard our hearts and you would guide us. May this parable teach us that in our life, even though you give us many things and you bless us in so many tremendous ways, all that we have and all that we are is to be completely dedicated to you. For me to add substitutes to my life, things that would try to stand in your place, is an awful thing. And yet I do it. And yet you forgive. And yet you are gracious. Please, help us as your people to walk in your ways. To decide every day that we want you and not anything else. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.